want to speak out of a familiar passage. It's Philippians 4, 4 through 9. Paul writes to the Philippians, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So let's start from the top here. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. When do we rejoice? Always. If our kid goes sideways, always. If a marriage isn't going the way that we planned, when do we rejoice? Always, Paul says. And then he almost anticipates that the Philippians, the, the ones reading this letter, are going to give a little pushback. Well, you know, maybe it's not always, Paul. Like there's certain situations where you can't rejoice, and it's almost like he anticipates that there's pushback. And he says, I will say it again, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. To rejoice is to show great delight. And as a Christian, we can rejoice in the Lord always because our circumstances don't determine our joy. Our circumstances can be depressing, they can cause anxiety, but Paul says rejoice in the Lord always because our joy and our hope is in him. The Bible says that the whole earth is his footstool. He's the king, he's in control, so I rejoice, I delight, I show great delight because God's on the throne. So he says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. In verse five, he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. And then Paul goes on to say in verse six, do not be anxious about anything. And I'm gonna pause there for just a second and talk about anxiety. Anxiety comes when we don't have control. So think about it. If something at work is out of our control, we get anxiety. If we're in a relationship where we feel like we're doing our part and the other person isn't, it's out of our control. If somebody gets a terrible diagnosis, it's out of our control. If we get a terrible diagnosis, it's out of our control. And what happens when we get anxious is we worry. And worry, I like to say, is praying to myself. Prayer is I have a conversation with God. Me and, me and God are dialoguing about what's going on. When I worry, I'm dialoguing with myself. My grandma was a worrier, and she gave me one of the most valuable lessons, literally on her deathbed. She didn't have enough energy to open her eyes, but we knew that she could hear us, and she was coherent. And every once in a while, she would, she would say something, because she was, she was very sharp, even at her age. And she said this on her, on her deathbed. She just whispered it out loud. She said, most of the things we worry about never happen. And that has stuck with me over the years because I'm, I'm imagining if I'm her examining her life, all the ways that she thought she might go, all the times that she thought something would happen to her kids or her grandkids or, or with her finances, all those years of worrying and her big regret on her deathbed was I spent all that time worrying and hardly anything that I worried about ever happened. And that's been such a lesson for me over the years. You're wasting away your time. Hardly any of that is ever going to happen. Paul's remedy here is, he says, do not be anxious about anything. That's what not to do. In every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. It's really a recipe. So if we think of, of presenting our request to God, let's say we have a bowl. And it's going to be something that we offer up to God. In that bowl, he's like, there's three things that you need to put in that bowl. One is, you need to pray. And I just said, prayer is, is dialoguing with God. Don't dialogue with yourself and create worst case scenarios. Dialogue with God. So put prayer in that mixture. The other thing is, put in petition. There's a specific type of prayer that you include when it comes to anxiety, and that's petition. And that's easy for us, because that's actually our default. Our default is to ask God for things. So he says, ask. Ask, pray, converse with God, listen to God, but petition him, ask for things. But then he says the last thing that you need to do to put in that mixture that you're going to offer up to God is you need to offer up thanksgiving. And what thanksgiving does when it comes to anxiety and worry is it reminds us of the faithfulness of God. So we're thanking God for what he's done over the years. We're thanking him for his faithfulness. And we're even thanking him somehow, some way, for the storm that we're in because he's doing something in the middle of it all. So when anxiety and worry come in, we've got three things that we do. Prayer, petition, and thanksgiving. When I first got married, I think it was year number two, I came home on my birthday, and my birthday is in the summer. And uh, Jeff's off in the summer because he's a teacher. So 
I came home every day about the same time, about five o'clock. I open the garage door and he immediately comes out the garage door. And I get out of the car and there's like this smoke smell. He's like, um, something not good just happened. We open the back door and it's the smoke in our house. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I tried to make you a birthday cake and it, it blew up. No, you don't understand it. Literally, it blew up. Because when he was doing the ingredients, instead of doing a teaspoon of baking soda, he did a cup of baking soda. And you could show the picture here. Literally five minutes into it, literally the cake, the cake blew up. We're talking about ingredients. What happens is with petition, we kick it in and we petition, right? But we put like a, a cup of baking soda in there as far as petition. Man, we're just storming heaven, asking, 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 asking. But we never put in the thanksgiving. And so we offer up to God prayer and petition, but the thanksgiving isn't in the mix, isn't in the recipe. And what Paul says is that in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And this is how God responds when all three of those things are in the mix. Verse seven, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, that means you're not going to understand it. People watching you go through your situation are not going to understand it. And it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's God's response to prayer, petition, and thanksgiving. That word guard there actually means a garrison. A garrison is armed soldiers. They've got shin guards. They've got shields, weapons, helmets. They're they're shoulder to shoulder, arm to arm, because they're protecting something important. When you offer a prayer, petition, and thanksgiving, God's response is he's going to send a garrison of peace around your mind. Isn't that where anxiety goes? And he's going to send a garrison of peace that's around your heart. He's going to protect you. And he says, the world's not going to understand it. You're not even going to understand it because it's supernatural. I want to close by sharing this story about Corey Ten Boom. Some of you may have read her book, The Hiding Place. She was a woman that was from Holland, her and her family. They owned a home in Holland, and I think it was a three-story home, and they were clockmakers. And they lived during World War II. As Germany began invading Holland, Her and her family, they were Christians, and instead of just turning inward and keeping themselves safe, they felt that their obligation was to protect Jewish people. And so up in the back corner of their house on the third floor, they created this room. They've knocked the wall out there so that you can see the actual hiding place. But that closet at the very bottom had an opening, and when they knew that someone was coming into their shop or or they thought they were going to get raided, they had this whole thing rigged up where they could alert the Jews that were hiding in the home, and they'd crawl into that bottom space there in the closet, and they'd go, and they'd hide in that space behind the wall. And eventually, they were turned in by somebody that they trusted, which of course was heartbreaking. And like so many families, uh, like Jewish families during that time, her family was split up. So they didn't all go to the same place. But her and her sister, Betsy, went to the same concentration camp. It was called Ravensbrook. And once they got to the camp, after a period of time, they were moved into this, I guess you call it dormitory. The row in the middle was so tight that only one person could walk through. You literally couldn't have two people walking two different ways. So the bunks were about a foot apart, and there were three bunks, and you couldn't sit up. And in this particular bunkhouse, it it was straw everywhere. That's what they slept on. And just because of the living conditions in there, women piled on top of women in the straw. There were a bunch of fleas in there. So the first day that they got moved into this bunkhouse, and of course, you got to remember, they did this to help other people. For me, there'd be some questions like, God, why? Why is this happening, period, to anyone? Why did we get caught? Why are we here? Why are we in the worst flea-infested bunkhouse in this whole concentration camp. And she said when they got in there, they were just so overwhelmed by the conditions that they were in. And she overheard her sister, Betsy, and she just really deliberately was saying, show us, show us how, show us how. And she didn't understand who she was talking to. And so she looked over at her and she realized that she was praying and then all of a sudden it turned into joy and she said God's given us the answer God's given us the answer and she said what is it and she said get that Bible out somehow they had managed to smuggle a Bible into the concentration camp without getting caught and she said get the Bible out she said do you remember what you were reading me this morning and she said turn to it as first Thessalonians 518 in everything give thanks for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. 
She said, Corey, in everything we give thanks. Let's start thanking him. And she said, well, what's it be thankful for? She said, let's thank him that we're together. So they held hands and started thanking God that they were together, that they hadn't been separated like they had from the rest of their family. And then she said, let's thank him that we have a Bible. Let's thank him that we didn't get caught. For some reasons, the guard didn't check us. So they started thanking God that they had a Bible. And then she said, let's thank God that it's crowded in here. And she said, I don't think I can thank God for that. And she said, no, 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 in everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. And so her sister started praying, God, we thank you that it's crowded in here and that we have a Bible because when we read it out loud, more people are going to hear. And then she goes, now let's thank him for the fleas. And she goes, no, there's no way. There's no way that, that God would expect that we'd be thankful for the fleas. No, she said, in everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. And so she began thanking God for the fleas. Well, as the weeks went by, Betsy started getting sick and emaciated, like so many of the pictures that you see. And so Corey and some of the ones that were healthier would, would go out and do work outside. But the ones that were really sick would stay in the bunkhouse. And they had a quota of different things that they were supposed to knit. And so because Betsy was sick, she'd stay in this deplorable bunkhouse with all the fleas. She was super fast at knitting, though. So she hit her quota by noon. So then when, when noon hit and she had all of her stuff done, she'd just go around to all the other ladies that are knitting and she'd just read the Word of God, read to, all, to the Jewish people, to the other people. She's just reading the Word of God, sharing the gospel, reading the Bible. And she couldn't ever figure out why the SS guards wouldn't come in. And then one day she had a question about the quota, and so she went outside to ask, and she said, can you come in here? We've got a question. And they said, no, we don't ever go inside of there. And they said, why? And they said, because of all those fleas. And so when Corey came back that day, Betsy had this huge look on her face, and she said, what is going on with you? Are you so excited? And she said, in everything we give thanks. I found out why they won't come in here, and I get to share the gospel. It's because of the fleas. We thank God for the fleas, and even the fleas God is using in everything, we give thanks. No matter what you're going through today, in everything, give thanks. Even if the bottom's falling out, you give thanks. Even if the marriage seems to be falling apart, you give thanks. If you're not sure what the future holds, you give thanks because it's the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Thank you for listening. We hope this message encouraged you. For additional resources or information on our upcoming events, head to resetministries.us. That's resetministries.us.